Good morning and welcome to Sojourn Baptist Church for April 26th. It seems appropriate during this time of social distancing to consider corporate worship and what it means to be together. Uh, And though we can still fellowship together by watching recorded messages together and meet virtually and pray for one another and worship through giving together, still we long to be together. But two things at least are still true about worship. Our God is worthy of worship and through the Holy Spirit, we are able to worship him in spirit and truth. The reading from the Valley of Vision this morning is entitled Worship. Glorious God, it is the flame of my life to worship thee, the crown and glory of my soul to adore thee, heavenly pleasure to approach thee. Give me power by the Spirit to help me worship now, that I might forget the world, be brought into fullness of life, be refreshed, comforted, blessed. Give me knowledge of thy goodness, that I might not be overawed by thy greatness. Give me Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God, that I might not be terrified, but be drawn near with filial love and holy boldness. Here is my mediator, brother, interpreter, branch, daysman, lamb, him I glorify. In him I am set on high. Crowns to give I have none, but what thou hast given I return. Content to feel that everything is mine when it is thine, and the more fully mine when I have yielded it to thee. Let me live wholly for my Savior, free from distraction, from carking care, from hindrances to the pursuit of the narrow way. I am pardoned through the blood of Jesus. Give me a new sense of it. Continue to pardon me by it. May I come every day to the fountain and every day be washed anew, that I may worship thee always in spirit and truth. Let's pray together. Father God, I do ask that you would be glorified in our worship at all times. Far from forsaking the coming together, we long to be together once again. And we pray for a quick resolution to the current situation that keeps us from gathering. I pray for your people this morning, for your church, for all the Christians around the world who find themselves in similar situations, unable to fellowship, unable to disciple one another the way that they would hope, unable to encourage one another with hugs and greetings. But Lord, we know that you are worthy of worship at all times, in all seasons, and we trust in you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless Pastor Jess as he delivers the word this morning. I thank you for his faithfulness to the word. I thank you for his faithfulness to you, for his love of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for this place and these people. Open our hearts to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin our time of singing today, I'd like to read to us from Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father. One of the things that we've missed during this time of being away from each other is being able to all sing together. There's just a handful of us who come up here to record, and so it doesn't sound the same when we're singing in here. We don't have the fullness of a sanctuary full of voices. And so it's kind of strange as we read the scriptures and we read something like this and we think about how do we do that? How do we sing to one another and admonish one another? Certainly we're doing it in smaller groups now. But I want to encourage us this morning to think about, to contemplate the invisible church. We know that as we sing together, as I sing even now, I know that later when you're watching this, there will be people on the other side of that screen who are singing along with us. I know that as the few of us sing together this morning that there are saints and angels in heaven who are in the presence of our God who are singing to him. And so we draw encouragement as we think about the invisible church. But we are blessed still to 
to be able to gather in small groups, many of us. And so maybe this, this uh, word is an encouragement to us this morning. If you're at home with your family, sing to one another. Encourage one another uh, in the Lord. So, and we certainly look forward to the time when we'll be able to gather together again to sing. But uh, we're going to begin singing this morning with He is Our God. Let's sing together. Let 
justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast Raise with Him to end His life He will hold me fast Until our faith is turned aside When He comes at last Again, church family, you are so very missed. I hope and pray that everyone is doing well during this time. As far as I'm aware, by God's blessings there and grace and mercy, there haven't been any cases of COVID-19 amongst our immediate congregation. Um, that doesn't mean there might not be some friends or extended family that might be suffering an illness of some sort. We can continue to be in prayer for our country and our governmental leaders and uh, healthcare workers and everyone else who is involved in this. Um, just know that you are missed. We are praying for you. Please reach out if there's any way in which we can help you during this time. We're going to continue our study from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 17, reading down to verse 24. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 through 24. Only as the Lord is assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you're able also to become free, rather do that. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with the price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your glorious word. We thank you that it still speaks today with such clarity. The needs of the church back in those days are still similar to our needs this day. And I pray you would help us to focus and to consider rightly your truth and interpret it rightly and apply it clearly to our lives. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin today, let me remind you of the setting of this letter. Here we are in the early days of the church, somewhere around the mid-50s AD, roughly 20 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. God's grace had extended in massive proportions to the Gentiles. And now the church in Corinth is receiving a letter from its founding missionary pastor, Paul. And this letter provides a series of corrections. The Corinthians had made several incorrect conclusions based upon their new status in Christ. Perhaps some of these mistakes were made in pursuit of what appeared to be spirituality, but the bottom line was that the church had gotten off track. So they needed to be reminded of what really mattered to God and how their new relationship with Christ was to be worked out upon the anvil of everyday experience. Let's pause there. We need this too don't we? Certainly our own church could suffer from knowing the gospel and a good deal of theology and yet fail to put that theology to work in day in, day out living. 
What a blessing that the Lord has not only provided us with knowledge of Jesus and his redemptive work, and has applied that work to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also has given us instructions on how we are to conduct ourselves as his children. He hasn't left us in the dark to make guesses about his will. He's revealed his will in his holy word, the Bible. And our task now is to read, to study, to know, and apply God's word. In recent weeks here at Sojourn, that's meant walking carefully through 1 Corinthians 7 and hearing God's will regarding marriage, widowhood, divorce, and remarriage. I hope and pray you have heard my words as those of a sincere man trying to do his level best to take God at his word and apply God's word as faithfully as I know how to the flock that he's entrusted to my care. I realize we may not always agree on all of the particulars, and I stand ready to discuss these matters further with any and all of you. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. For my interpretations must be subjected to the whole counsel of God, just as every man's must be. Search and examine the scriptures, dear brothers and sisters, and commit to doing what you find there, for God's will is always best. And should you happen upon something that you have to admit sin regarding, confess that, repent, and receive the Lord's forgiveness. Be refreshed by God's grace and empowered to live differently moving forward. We can't change our past, but we can look with hope to the future. So Paul has been addressing the issue of marriage here in 1 Corinthians 7, giving God's instructions on God's institution. But in the verses we come to today, we see Paul's overarching principle that guides this entire discussion. A single command rules the entire instruction from 1 Corinthians 7. And the word is, the command is, the imperative is, remain. The structure is somewhat like that of a club sandwich or a Big Mac, like <laughs> with three layers, you know, like the three layers of bread would be kind of this three-layered repetition of this maxim in verse 17, 20, and 24. The word there in Greek translated, keep on remaining. And Paul makes it clear that this principle is universally applicable for he says, thus I command in all the churches. This is not some niche case. This is not just some particular scenario. This is a general rule that is applicable to all the churches. But what is meant by this order, remain? Why are we to remain in the calling in which we were called? There appears to be at least two driving reasons which can be summarized with two points that we'll look at together today. The first is this, fulfill the assignment given to you. Point one, fulfill the assignment given to you. And maintain, therefore, as your first priority, the keeping of God's commandments. In these verses, we're confronted with a couple of illustrations of things which Paul counts as nothing and about which we should not care. But before we look at those, I want you to see what does matter to the Apostle Paul. We find it at the end of verse 19. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. It appears that the matter of first priority for Paul is to focus our attention rightly, to ensure that our priorities are set correctly. The Corinthians appeared to be allowing lesser things to become primary. You see, even good things can become bad things if they become ultimate things. If we allow social and cultural and religious climates to run our lives, they could distract us from our real and genuine calling to obey God, loving him, keeping his commandments. Remember Jesus' words to the Pharisees regarding their stress upon ritual observance at the expense of their obedience to the word of God. As recorded in Matthew 5, 15, 5, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God, he is not to honor his father or mother. By this you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Pharisees had a way of talking about people vowing things unto the Lord's service and therefore would be excused from helping out their own uh, parents. And Jesus says here, by these traditions, you've invalidated the very word of God. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting 
the others. Now, before we chastise the Pharisees too strongly, please recognize, dear brother and sister, we too can fall into the same trap. It's so easy to get wrapped up in secondary issues at the expense of furthering the gospel and obeying God's clear commands. Paul not only instructed Timothy to build up the church with sound words in the pastoral epistles, but also to guard against distractions and disputes about frivolous things. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 5, As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. He says in his second letter to Timothy, in chapter 2, verse 14, remind them of these things, solemnly charge them in the presence of God, not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. There are many things that vie for our attention, that vie to be number one priority in our life. We must maintain focus upon God's revealed will in Scripture and not allow anything to distract our attention away. We're to live in allegiance to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in all things. The principle has already been applied to the subject of one's marital state, whether married or divorced, widowed or single, as we've seen in the previous context here. He's, Paul said, remain in those states that you are. These things are important things, but they're not ultimate things. And so he says, remain and serve the Lord in the state that you're found. But Paul, in this text, applies this truth even further. He makes use of two further points of application from the two great religious and social divisions of his day. The religious distinction, first of all, is that of circumcision versus uncircumcision. Look at verse 18. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He's not to become uncircumcised. Is anyone called when in uncircumcision? He's not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. It says here, if you were called while circumcised, if you became a Christian while already circumcised, do not try to remove the marks of that circumcision. Now, we know that circumcision was a sign of the old covenant, and Jewish men hearing the gospel in the first century would most certainly have been circumcised. For Gentiles, though, it was a matter of scorn, the mark of a despised people. So there might have been societal pressure upon believing Jews, Christian Jews, to remove the marks of their circumcision. Josephus, the historian, tells about Jewish men during Greek rule who wanted to be accepted into Greek society, who would literally undergo a surgery to make themselves appear to be uncircumcised whenever they bathed or exercised at the gymnasiums. Celsus, a Roman encyclopedist in the first century AD, describes even that surgical procedure. Now, if a Jewish youth underwent a surgical operation trying to efface the marks of his circumcision, uh, he would be seen as enlightened by the Greeks, coming into, arriving into Hellenistic culture. But Paul says here, don't do this. And then on the flip side, if you were, became a Christian while uncircumcised, he says, don't become circumcised. Remember, for Jews, circumcision was everything. And as a matter of fact, there are even a group of Judaizers who are encouraging Gentiles to be circumcised in order to be in right relationship with the Lord. And to this, Paul emphatically declares, no way. Paul says circumcision and uncircumcision, which religiously were considered everything during his day, are now counted as nothing. He says in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Or in Galatians 6, 15, For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. By nothing, Paul means that the subject of circumcision is irrelevant in respect to salvation and when compared with keeping God's commandments. One commentator noted that fussing about circumcision or uncircumcision would be like that of uh, fussing over the rearrangement of deck chairs upon the Titanic, a pointless exercise which would only generate needless anxiety. Salvation transforms these and relativizes these earthly distinctions. As Paul also says in Galatians 3.28, there, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Which brings us to the second point of application that Paul makes use of here, the social distinction. He goes from the religious distinction, seen in circumcision or uncircumcision, to a social distinction, one seen 
between the slave versus the free man. And he says, if you are called to Christ while a slave, don't let it trouble you. Or don't be anxious about it. Don't worry about it. You didn't have a choice in that matter. You don't have a choice in that matter anyway right now. He says, you're while enslaved, remember that in Christ you are God's freedman. A slave can uniquely show how a believer can serve God even while under the limits imposed by slavery. And even you could say in a sense in which a free man cannot. We are reminded of his instruction, Paul's instruction in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 5 and following. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. He says, if enslaved, don't let this trouble you. Just remember that in Christ, you are a free man in Christ. You are God's freed man. And then he says, if you were called to Christ while free, remember that in Christ, you are God's slave. A free man can uniquely show how a believer without the limits imposed by slavery maintains a submissive and humble spirit towards the Lord in all things. And then he says, but if rather to be freed, rather utilize that. If able to be freed, rather make use of that. There's been interpretation issues regarding this phrase, what's being referred to. There's kind of two camps of interpretation. The, the one reads this negatively in the sense of when if you're faced with the opportunity for freedom, stay enslaved instead. Refuse to allow your position to change. Uh, to that kind of interpretation, though, I, I ask what does that really mean? I mean, what choice did a slave have to remain enslaved if they had been emancipated? So I think rather the way this should be read is the way that I think it reads a little bit more naturally. If given the opportunity to be free... Go ahead and do it. Make use of the freedom that you're granted. It also fits the structural pattern that we find throughout 1 Corinthians 7, where there's a maximum, a maxim, uh, a general principle that's followed by an exception. You see this in verse 8 and 9, 10 and 11, 12 through 15, 26 and 28. I don't think we have to do a lot of arguing to explain why freedom is to be preferred over slavery. But Paul's point in bringing this up at all is to say that God's will can be done from either position. So don't make your socioeconomic position an ultimate thing. While physical freedom is certainly good, spiritual freedom is more important, see Romans 6.22. And one can serve Christ from either physical slavery or physical freedom. I'm sure that it is indeed the gospel's impact on individuals that has led to the abolition movements all over the world. And we can thank the Lord for this. The biblical worldview, which clearly explains that there is only one race, the human race, all descendants of Adam, and that all men are made in God's image, is the proper grounding for us to accord all men dignity, honor, and respect. This truth lies at the heart of refusing to treat anyone as intrinsically inferior. But the emphasis of Paul's instruction here is to direct our energy toward living for God in no matter what social construct we find ourselves. Richard Hayes explains, well, Paul's point is not to insist that people must remain in their present status, even to the extent of refusing emancipation. Rather, his point is to reassure his readers that they should not be troubled about their present social position, and that they should focus their attention on serving God wherever they stand in the social order. I know for you as my hearers, um, as far as I'm aware of, people listening to this are not themselves in a position of slavery. But perhaps sometimes you might feel trapped in a position socially or economically. And there may be times when a change of job or location is made available to you. And it's not that you can never change locations or move to a different job. The point, though, of this text is to make clear here that our focus must not be on external things, but on the internal. Not on temporary things, but the eternal. Not on changing our environments, but obeying God's word, fulfilling his commands. 
So rather than living your life based upon guesses about what might appear to be a more spiritual state, live and walk in accordance with God's revealed will as found in the Bible, i.e. keep his commandments. That's the first part of our assignment. The first part of our assignment is to keep his commandments. The second, though, might be captured by the phrase, walk out your mission. Walk out your mission. Learn contentment in your calling. The word walk is re used repeatedly in the New Testament to describe the Christian life. Peripatito is to walk. It often means they'll behave or live or to conduct oneself. Just to give you a sampling of this word used in the New Testament, Romans 6, 4, you, that you might walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit. Uh, Colossians 2, 6, as you received him, so walk in him. Philippians 3, 17, walk according to our example. Ephesians 5, 15, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but wise. Ephesians 2, 10, God prepared good works for us to walk in. 2 John 1, 4, uh, he expresses joy over hearing his, his children walking in the truth. Ephesians 5, 8, walk as children of light. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love. Colossians 1, 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him. The command here is also to walk. Only as the Lord is assigned to each one, verse 17, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Your walk is the life you live. It's the mission given to you. God has orchestrated the circumstances under which you believed in the gospel. This includes all of your sins and failures, all your sorrows and regrets, every pain and tear, every joy and gladness, every situation, whether good or bad, leading you to the cross was part of God's plan. And so your walk with Christ, while bearing likenesses to the walk of other brothers and sisters, is yet unique to you, which means your mission is uniquely yours. No one else can be you, nor can you be anyone else. Ed Moore preached a sermon at T4G this year entitled Encouragement for Pastors, in which I was reminded of this reality. He said this, your ministry is the wacky confluence of who you are and where God has placed you. Your gifting, your background, your education, your weaknesses, strengths, your spouse, your kids, your family, your sins, joys, and sorrows, put all of that into a blender and then add to that your ministry. So that's your life. Add to that your ministry, the people you're in contact with, their needs, their demands, their fears, their history, their giving, their commitment, their strength, their weaknesses, their holiness, their sins. Put all of that into a blender, push puree, blend it together, and you start to get an idea of what your ministry is. All Christians have a similar calling in that we were called by God to his son, Jesus Christ, through regeneration by the Holy Spirit. All of us are sinners, saved by sheer unmerited and undeserved grace. All of us depend completely upon the mercy of the Lord and the completed work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We all owe him everything, and we've been commissioned by him to share his good news with the world. In this sense, all of us have the same mission, and yet there are only so many people that I will meet in my life and only so many people that I have given an op been given an opportunity to impact for eternity. I have been placed at a particular time in a particular location in history with a particular set of gifts and abilities. My walk is to keep God's commandments in the particular context in which I have been placed. Negatively, I can say it this way, I must not envy the assignment of others, but rather rejoice in the God who designed and fitted me uniquely for a distinctive mission for his glory. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, bloom where you're planted. Phrases like these can be trite at times and sometimes unhelpful, but there just might be a kernel of truth that we need to remind, be reminded of in these phrases at times. Paul is absolutely teaching this principle here. Bloom where you have been planted. Enjoy the light you've been 
provided. Drink the water you're being showered with. Soak in the nutrients found in the soil that you're rooted in and bloom. Grow to God's glory. Flower to his renown. Now, the Bible often calls us to look at creation, to see spiritual principles demonstrated in the fabric of the beautiful and orderly universe that God has made. For example, look at the ant, thou sluggard, or consider the birds, or consider the lilies of the field. And so I wondered this week, we're told to bloom where we're planted, but what if we're furnished with a less than advantageous circumstance? Does God still expect us to thrive in those cases? I wonder, does God provide us with an illustration of this in creation? And so I did what any wise man would do. He goes to his go-to fact researcher to ask for him to do a little project for me this week. And he assured me that he could fit me into his busy schedule amidst uh, the social distancing. So my son Joel provided me with a few examples of plants that live in extreme environments. So please consider the few that I offer here as just a sampling of the incredible plants that God has designed and fitted with exactly what they need to not only survive, but thrive in adverse conditions. And I know we could do a similar study on animals. Maybe, Joel, you can work on that for me for next week. For example, the cushion plant. It lives in, extre in the extreme cold of the tundra region. Living in an uninviting climate, you'd be amazed to discover that they feel very soft from which they get their name, cushion. They can grow up to 10 feet in diameter and live up to 350 years. Being in Texas, certainly we're familiar with various types of cacti, which are able to live from 10 to 200 years in conditions in which little rain falls. Cacti are flowering plants, so every kind of cactus is capable of blooming when mature, even in the context of little rain. The flowers help absorb water whenever it does rain, and the spikes on the cactus provide protection against predators and help against water loss. The desert ironwood, as its name identifies, lives in the desert. It has bluish uh, gray-green leaves, which it can shed in order to survive prolonged droughts. This tree provides shelter to many animals who use its seeds and leaves for food and shade. And this tree can live up to 1,500 years. Silver sword, also known as the crown jewel of the volcanic mountain Moana Kei in Hawaii, has silver hairs on their leaves from which it gets its name. These spherically shaped plants can live around 50 years while resisting freezing temperatures and high winds and dehydration. In environments where hot, fast-moving fires are frequent, the jack pine, table mountain pine, and lodgepole pine species have developed very thick, hard cones, which are literally glued shut with a strong resin. These serotonous cones can hang on a pine tree for years, long after the enclosed seeds mature. Only when a fire sweeps through, melting the resin, do these heat-dependent cones open up releasing seeds that are then distributed by wind and gravity. So following the destruction of a forest fire, the forest is seeded anew with the seeds of these pines. Do you see the principle? If God can so equip the vegetation of the earth, providing them with the resources to thrive in adverse climates, don't you believe he can do the same for you? This brings us to our second point. Leverage the opportunities afforded by your circumstances. What is the second reason we remain and how do we do, go about doing this? Why do we do this? We leverage the opportunities afforded by our circumstances. Leverage the opportunities afforded by your circumstances. The way you do this, first of all, is by living mindful that God's sovereignty includes your circumstances. I'm sure if I polled our congregation and asked them, asked all of you, do you believe that God is sovereign? If you were here in this room with me right now, I would hear, I'm sure, a 100% answer of yes. If I further asked, do you believe that God's sovereignty extends to all things? I similarly believe I'd get a near 100% affirmative answer from you. And yet the question is this, do we live in light of that 
truth. When things seem to go out of control, when disaster strikes, when layoffs come, when sickness wrecks havoc on our bodies, when relationships get difficult, when finances are tight, when plans go awry, when colleges don't accept us, when proposals get declined, when friends betray us, when we feel abandoned. The question we should be asking ourselves is, do I really believe that God is sovereign over all events, that he's orchestrated all things that come to pass? And if so, I must admit that even in some mysterious way, a way unknown to me, whatever is happening to me is part of God's good plan. Why can I say that? Because Romans 8.28 says that we know that God causes all things to work together for good for, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So rather than moan and complain about our situation that we find ourselves in, as those who don't know God would do, we must not think of mere circumstances that we're in as ultimate issues. Because the circumstances we're in don't give us meaning and purpose. They don't define who we are. Rather, our circumstances are just a platform for gospel opportunity. John MacArthur says it well. Only sin can keep us from obeying and serving the Lord. Circumstance cannot. Therefore, if we are in a difficult, uncomfortable, and restricting situation, we should not worry about it, but should determine to be faithful as long as the Lord leaves us there and accept any changes that might come along. We must learn alongside the Apostle Paul, who said in Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And then the famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Notice that the all things of Philippians 4.13, which Paul could do, included having abundance and suffering need, being filled and going hungry. In any and every circumstance, he learned the secret of contentment. And this is what he means by being able to do all things, being able to handle all circumstances. So rather than working overtime to change our circumstances, Paul wants to redirect our attention towards recognizing the unique opportunities that are afforded to us right where we are right now. Consider the people you know the places you go, the things you do, the talents you have, the sphere of influence you affect, and walk out your ministry. We're deceived if we believe happiness is ultimately found in outward circumstances. You might even ask yourself in moments of that, even if I accomplish the goals that I have, what eternal difference am I making? And if you can't think of anything, perhaps your time and energy is better used elsewhere. I can guarantee you it's better used elsewhere. Remember where you are and see your calling as an assignment, a distinct and unique platform for ministry. Your vocation or your calling is the sum of the particulars, the limitations, the restrictions, the blessings, the giftings, the opportunities that are given to you as you meet with God's command and his assignment. And therefore, we each have been given a a soapbox. What do I mean by this? What's a soapbox? Well, a soapbox is just anything at hand that is useful towards a grander purpose. We often speak of uh, street evangelists as having a soapbox, and we even use that phrase to talk about somebody who gets on a tear about something, and they just kind of go on and on and on about it. But a soapbox for the street evangelist is, isn't anything all that great. But when put into gospel service, the soapbox becomes a pulpit for gospel ministry. Now, not all of us are pastors. Not all of us have been given literal pulpits like this one to speak from. But we all have metaphorical ones. So what's yours? What ordinary thing can you put into service for the Lord and therefore give it greater significance and purpose? For example, is your occupation not only a means of employment, but also a platform for living out the Christian life? Are you obeying God's commandments and walking out your mission in the workplace? Or instead, are you missing opportunities because all you're doing is complaining and fussing about your present circumstances? 
Is your marriage or singleness similarly a platform for declaring God's greatness? Or on the other hand, are you spending more time moaning about the difficulties that you're experiencing with or without a spouse? If you're a parent, do you see your role as that of planting gospel seeds in the next generation? Have you attempted, have you accepted from your, let's say, from your own history, from your own childhood, that your parents and guardians who have raised you were God-given? Are you seeking to respond to your own history with gratitude over God's watch care for you, even through the good and bad? Have you forgiven those whom you need to forgive and thank God for bringing you to himself when and how he has? Or you find yourself more complaining about your past? Do you thank the Lord for the biological sex that he has made you? Are you seeking to honor him with either biblical manhood or womanhood in accordance with his design? Or instead, are you chafing under the responsibilities and privileges given you? Are you leveraging the talents and resources that God has afforded you? Or are you complaining that he didn't give you what he gave someone else? Even as a citizen of this country, do you always keep in mind that you're actually just a sojourner here on pilgrimage awaiting the new heavens and new earth? Are you ready to tell others of the greater kingdom of which you are a part? so that they might be welcomed home as well one day there. Oh, that we would be given eyes to see our situations as outposts for the gospel. That we would recognize that our sovereign God, an all-wise strategist, has assembled his ambassadors, and he's placed them precisely where he wants them. He has distributed them far and wide to shine his lights in a dark world. Each of us has a distinct and unique calling. Each of us has been given a unique assignment to fulfill that no one else can fulfill. Our responsibility is not to fulfill the assignment of another, but to fulfill the assignment handed to us. And our time is best spent when focused squarely on our primary mission, learning to be content with outward circumstances, giving our best effort to the advancement of God's kingdom for God's glory. So we leverage opportunities afforded us by our circumstances by living in light of God's sovereignty and secondly, in light of God's presence. Remember whose you are and that you are not alone. Remember whose you are and that you are not alone. We live in a day of far-reaching identity crisis. There are so many who claim to be trying to find themselves or to discover their own truth and phrases like that. The problem that is indicated in these statements arises in large measure from a failure to recognize that we are fundamentally creatures created by God. In this sense, all created things bear the stamp of the creator. The creator is also the sovereign and Lord, whether we admit it or not. But therein lies the problem for so many. So many of our day refuse God as creator and Lord. They attempt to ignore the reality of their coming death and a judgment to follow from a holy God whom they have spurned. And as a result, we ought not be surprised at the identity crisis that exists. People are trying to figure out who they are. They're trying to find their place in this world without acknowledging the one without whom there would be no world, nor you, nor me. For the Christian, though, these things come into focus. We come to realize that my identity is found not so much in who I am, but whose I am. Verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. We are not our own. We were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Or as Revelation 5.9 says it, they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You see, this is what gives the sticking power to persevere in tough circumstances, some of which are otherwise, frankly, unbearable. We remember that we've been purchased by God by the blood of Jesus. There's a wonderful scene in the recent movie Overcomer in which Hannah Scott answers the question, who is Hannah Scott? And she says this after having read and studied God's word. I am created by God. 
He designed me, so I'm not a mistake. His son died for me, so I could be forgiven. He picked me to be his own, so I'm chosen. He redeemed me, so I am wanted. He showed me grace, so I could be saved. He has a future for me, because he loves me. I am a child of God. You see, Hannah is right here in the sense that our identity as Christians is found, who I am is found in whose I am. My identity is found in being his. And this truth gives purpose to my life, gives meaning to my daily walk. It transforms my circumstances into a context for kingdom work. And being his means we're also never alone. God is always with us. Look at verse 24. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in the condition in which he was called. Note here, each one is to remain in the condition in which he was called. It's something we've already been told in this passage. But note in verse 24, there's the added phrase, with God. You are not alone in your circumstances. Remain there with God. God, the Lord, is with you. He's strengthening you. He's granting you wisdom. He's giving you perspective. He's informing your mind. He's granting speech to your mouth. He's directing your hands and your feet. When Jesus issued the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he not only commanded believers to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing and teaching them, but he promised to always be with them, even to the end of of the age. Paul exclaimed in Romans 8 that he was convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my walk, my mission, my obedience to God's commandments is also with God. My obedience is to God, but my obedience is with God. My mission is to God, but my mission is with God. He's with me every step of the way. So don't allow the classifications of this world to define who you are. You've been bought by Christ. You are his. And don't get sidetracked in your purpose. Don't forget whose you are and who is with you. God used your circumstances to bring you to Christ by his calling. God has given you a unique mission to accomplish through his assignment. God provides directives for you to live out via his commandments. And God calls you to persevere in your calling with his presence. As long as your present situation is not against God's commandments... As long as you're not engaged in sin and the things that you're doing, your energies will be spent, should be spent working hard to be thoroughly Christian in whatever circumstance you find yourself. As Gordon Fee has said, a change in any of the indicators of status doesn't change your ability to glorify God in your life, just provides context for doing that. Your calling in Christ supersedes all conditions, or better said, it transforms them into context for living out Christian calling. There are unique opportunities afforded to you, dear friend, because you are in a position that no one else is in. You are related uniquely to a distinct set of people, and you are given a distinct opportunity to interact with them. So rather than being preoccupied with changing our circumstances, be faithful to the Lord in whatever situation you find yourself, whether married or single, whether slave or free, whether Jew or Gentile, wherever you are, bloom where you are planted. Remain for the cause of Christ and for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your awesome and holy word. We thank you for the direction that it provides us. I ask that you would provide each of us the stick to to remain and serve you faithfully. Lord, help us to recognize circumstances as not primary issues, but the keeping of your commandments and the fulfillment of the mission you've given us as primary. May we glorify you as we use our unique contexts as a platform for gospel ministry. And may you save a great host of people through our testimony and bring glory to your name. 
We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.